Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Please be merciful to me this morning. It has been an interesting week. Um, I won't go into all the details, but uh, this may be one of the less polished sermons you uh, hear me preach, but I'll try to get through it as well as I can. Uh, I was sick earlier this week, and I'm not contagious anymore. I'm almost completely sure, but <laughs> still dealing with some of the after effects of that. Let's uh, go ahead and pray. <coughs> Father, thank you so much for your word, for its depth, for its beauty, for its power. Please help us to respond to it as we should this morning. Help me to explain it properly. Thank you so much for your magnificent promises, the ones that have been fulfilled and the ones that have yet to be fulfilled. For the peace that you offer us through Christ and for the great peace that will become a reality for all the world when he comes again. Please bless this time this morning and help our hearts to be once again right before you as we hear your word and respond to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Everyone has faith. We talked about King Ahaz last week, a man whose faith in God was empty. But to say he didn't have faith at all would be incorrect. To call religious people people of faith is a little bit of a redundancy. Everyone has faith. Christians, Buddhists, atheists, Satanists, even agnostics have faith in something. The members of the Heaven's Gate cult who believed that killing themselves as the Hale-Bopp comet passed Earth would allow them to transcend their humanity and join the crew of an alien spaceship. It's bizarre, but it's, it's tragic. They had faith. They had great faith. What makes faith itself great, what makes it valuable, is not in the person having the faith. It's not in the strength of the faith itself. It is in the object of the faith. Mm -hmm. It is in what you are trusting. That's what matters. Last week, we met King Ahaz in Isaiah chapter 7, the one to whom the promise of Emmanuel was given. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. We saw that he had strong fear that there were enemies coming against him that he knew he wasn't strong enough to meet and it was making him and the other inhabitants of the land shake like trees in the wind. We saw that he had no real faith in God. When Even when Isaiah asked him to name a sign so that God could prove to him his ability to rescue him. Ahaz turned it down. And then comes the promise in verse 13 of Isaiah chapter 7. Listen now, O house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will be with child. Bear a son. She will call his name Emmanuel. This is one of the most amazing prophecies that we have concerning the birth of Christ. And another one of the most amazing prophecies we have 
about his coming is in chapter 9, where uh, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And if all goes according to plan, in two weeks, that's where we'll be. But in between these two great prophecies, there's a lot of other prophecy, and there are a lot of details that are confusing, that are difficult to get through, and I may not answer all of your questions this morning. I may not even know all the answers to your questions this morning, but I do hope that we can in some way come to the conclusion together that difficult passages like these should not be skipped over, that all scripture is profitable <coughs> and has something to teach us about God and about ourselves. So just as a reminder, the players in this story, if we're going to understand these prophecies, we have to understand who they're about. So hold in your head, first of all, the kingdom of Israel is at this point in history two kingdoms. You have the northern kingdom, which is most of the tribes, and then you have the southern kingdom of Judah. And Isaiah is ministering in the southern kingdom. When he talks to you in this passage, it's the kingdom of Judah he's talking to, and to their king, Ahaz. But you also have the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom was ruled by generally even more ungodly kings than the southern kingdom. They were very pagan in their culture although God still treated them as his people and constantly sent prophets to them to bring them back. But the northern kingdom was ruled by a man named Pekah at this time. And just north of the northern kingdom of Israel was another kingdom called Aram. Aram. And the capital of Aram was Damascus. Okay, it's up north of Israel desert kingdom, and that was ruled by Rezin. So Pekah and Rezin, the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel and Aram, made a treaty together because of another major player that we didn't really look at last week, but the kingdom of Assyria. They were both afraid of the kingdom of Assyria, which was gaining power, taking over other countries, building an empire in that part of the world. And the kingdom of Assyria was named, uh, ruled by a man named Tiglath-Pileser. You don't have to remember that one. <laughs> the kingdom of Assyria was brutal, they were powerful, and Pekah and Rezin these two kings, near to Judah, north of Judah, made an alliance to fight against him, to resist him. And they wanted Judah to be part of that same federation, that part, same alliance, to make them stronger against Assyria. And in order to do that, they attacked Judah and attempted to put their own king in power, a puppet king that they could control. And uh, that's why Ahaz was so afraid, because this was a personal attack on him, really, and on his line, the line of David, the line from which Christ would one day come. But the greatest danger we're going to see that Ahaz faced did not come from the two nations he feared, but from the nation he was tempted to trust instead of trusting God. His greatest danger did not come from the nations he feared, but from the nation he was tempted to trust instead of trusting God. Isaiah's prophecy begins, at least, on a hopeful no. And the first thing we're going to be looking at today, the first thing he describes is the coming deliverance of Judah. 
the coming deliverance. In verse 14 of chapter 7, as we've already read, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 15. He will eat curds and honey in order that he will know to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Now if you were reading along in your own Bible last week, which I hope you were, um, I encourage you to do that. But if you read a little bit further than I did and came to these verses, you probably said something like, wait, what? Is this even talking about Jesus here? And uh, it can be a confusing element of biblical prophecy, but this was written for people right then. And this was intended as a sign, to be seen as a sign by King Ahaz himself. And there is such a thing as a near and far fulfillment. Um, on Wednesday nights, we've been going through the Psalms. And we see that in a lot of what David says, it's true about himself and the things that he went through. But it's even more true about Christ. David was rescued from dying. Jesus Christ was actually rescued out of death itself. David was righteous in the sight of God because of his faith, Jesus Christ actually was righteous and perfect and blameless in all his ways. The things that David says about himself are even more true about Christ because David himself is a picture of Christ. He was a foreshadowing of Christ. And the <coughs> same thing comes up elsewhere in Scripture. Um, Antiochus Epiphanes who we'll talk about eventually in Sunday school, who sacrificed a pig on the altar during the time between the Testaments. The book of Daniel talks about him prophetically. A lot of people um, thought he was the ultimate fulfillment of what Daniel was talking about when he did that. But we know that there is going to be another antichrist later who behaves in a very similar way. And Antiochus, the things that he did are the things that the Antichrist is going to do. Um, Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the temple, and the disciples probably looked at each other when he said that and said, wait, didn't that happen already? But the first time it happened, it was a picture. It was a foreshadowing of the next time, the greater time that it would. There are many things. We don't have time to list all of them now. But it's a common theme in scripture when God makes a promise he foreshadows it in some way and that's what's happening here some people debate over whether there actually was a child born in Isaiah's day named Emmanuel I suppose it's possible and if there was it is clear that he was a picture of the real Emmanuel, Jesus, who came later. But more likely, the child who fulfills this part of the prophecy in verse 16, before he will know to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. That part of the sign was fulfilled by a son of Isaiah himself. This son that Isaiah had was a picture or foreshadowing of Christ. Down in chapter 8. After Isaiah had delivered this prophecy to Ahaz, it says, Then Yahweh said to me, Take for yourself a large tablet, and write on it in ordinary letters, or in the letters of man, concerning Maharshal al-Hashbaz. Yes, I did 
practice that. <laughs> Mahershal al Hashabaz means a swift, I'm sorry, quick to the plunder, swift to the spoil. I mean, you could switch those around. They, he basically says the same thing twice in different words. Quick to the plunder, swift to the spoil. And uh, he was to take, in verse 2, I will take to myself faithful witnesses for testimony, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberechiah. All right. So Isaiah announced this child's name. This was the name of the child he was going to have. And he had witnesses verify it. He wrote this down before the child was even conceived. From a human standpoint, it was not guaranteed at all that Isaiah's wife was going to conceive or that the child would survive or that it would be a boy. But when the child was born, as Isaiah predicted, it confirmed the meaning of his name and the prophecy that was made about him. Then I drew near, drew near to the prophetess, that's Isaiah's wife, and she conceived and bore a son. Then Yahweh said to me, Call his name Mahershalal Hashbaz, for before the boy knows how to cry out, My father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be carried away before the king of Assyria. So this is similar to the promise he made before. The, before the boy comes out of childhood, this is going to happen. These kings will be no more. These kings that are terrifying you. Their land will be destroyed. So like I said, his name means quick to the plunder, swift to the spoil. It's like something soldiers would say after defeating a city, rushing in and seizing its plunder. The spoil of Samaria, the wealth of Damascus. So both of these kingdoms, it will be taken away by the king of Assyria, and it will be taken away quickly. When people heard that Maharshal al-Hashbaz had been born, the people of Judah could be sure that the defeat of their enemies was imminent. His birth was a symbol of hope for their nation. In a similar but far greater way, the birth of Emmanuel, Jesus himself, was announced by the angels as good news of great joy, which was for all people. Isaiah recognized that the ultimate fulfillment of these things was still to come. He was talking about these kings and this situation right here, but he knew that ultimately this was for people who had not yet been born. Down at the end of chapter 8, almost, in uh, verse 16. In verse 16 through 18, Isaiah gives these instructions regarding what he has written here. He says, bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. So, seal it up, store it with my disciples. <clears throat> And I will wait for Yahweh, who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob. And I will hope for him. Behold, I and the children whom Yahweh has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel from Yahweh of hosts, who dwells on Mount Zion. He and the children whom Yahweh had given him represented looked forward to signs and wonders that God was going to achieve in Israel. Even though at that time it appeared that God was hiding his face from the house of Jacob. Uh, by the way, we've met one of Isaiah's sons already, the one who went with him to see King Ahaz. Um, that was Shir Jashub, 
And his name means a remnant shall return. A remnant shall return. And of course, the idea of Mahershal al-Hashbaz's name is the defeat of Israel's enemies. The two kings attacking Judah were defeated at this time. And after the Israelites had been exiled by Babylon, a remnant of them did return to their land. Both of these prophecies came true fairly soon after Isaiah's ministry. But these events foreshadowed even greater victories. And we don't have time again to go into all of that now. But there will be a far greater deliverance from the enemies of Israel and a far greater gathering of all Israelites to the land of Israel when Christ returns. He will accomplish the ultimate fulfillment of these things. So that's the uh, coming deliverance that Isaiah talked about. Let's move on to the coming desolation. We've been looking at the bright side up till now, but overall, as you read this passage, it is not a happy prophecy. It's not a good prophecy for Ahaz and his people. Let's go back to chapter 7, verse 15. says, He will eat curds and honey in order that he will know to refuse evil and choose good. The reference to curds and honey sounds like a good thing, but it is not. And we'll find out a little bit later what that means. Moving on, verse 16. For before the boy will know to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. Yahweh will bring on you, on your people, talking to Ahaz, and on your father's house, days which have never come since the day that Ephraim separated from Judah, the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria is the judgment that is coming. With one hand, God takes away these two kings that Ahaz fears, and with his other hand, he brings in the king of Assyria to judge him. Aram and northern Israel would be destroyed, and they were. But that same force that destroyed them would not stop there. And it would desolate the kingdom of Judah as well. Remember, this prophecy is a response to Ahaz's lack of faith in God. Isn't the wisdom and justice of God just mind-blowing? Again, it wasn't the things that Ahaz feared that were his greatest danger. It was the thing, it was the people that he was tempted to trust instead of trusting God. We can see clearly from what Ahaz did after this that he did not take at least this aspect of Isaiah's prophecy seriously. In 2 Kings chapter 16, verses 7 and 8. It says, So Ahaz sent messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and save me from the hand of the king of Aram and from the hand of the king of Israel, who are rising up against me. Ahaz also took the silver and gold that was found in the house of Yahweh, that's the temple, and in the treasuries of the king's house, and sent a gift to the king of Assyria. And in response to this gift and this plea, this declaration of loyalty to Assyria that Ahaz made, the king of Assyria agreed. He came in, he conquered Aram, took over Damascus, then he came south into Israel. He defeated them, took many of the people out of the land. 
brought in new people to populate the land. The northern kingdom um, was destroyed, defeated here, but destroyed completely in the time of Ahaz's son, Hezekiah. But another result of this, a very immediate result, was that the kingdom of Judah became subject to Assyria. That the king of Assyria began viewing and treating the kingdom of Judah as his subject nation. Making them pay tribute to him. But it did get worse than that. Verses 18 and 19 of Isaiah chapter 7. And it will be in that day that Yahweh will whistle for a fly, for the fly that is in the remotest part of the rivers of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they will all come and rest upon the steep ravines, on the crevices of the cliffs, on all the thorn bushes, and on all the watering places. God used both Egypt and Assyria to punish the people of Judah in the days before they were finally conquered by Babylon. But it was Assyria that struck first and hardest. Verse 20, In that day the Lord will shave with a razor, one hired from regions beyond the river, that is the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria is the razor God will use to shave the head and the hair of the legs, and it will also remove the beard. The king of Assyria would be God's tool for judgment, cutting down basically both of the great and the lowly, the rich and the poor, from the kingdom of Judah. And this happened during, again, the son of Ahaz, Hezekiah's reign. The Assyrians never managed to take Jerusalem itself. And you may remember from the story of Hezekiah how God delivered them in an amazing way, but not until after the Assyrians had devastated the rest of the nation. And we see a picture of that devastation in verses 21 through 25. And it will be in that day that a man may keep alive a heifer and a pair of sheep. And because of the abundance of the milk produced, he will eat curds, and everyone that is left within the land will eat curds and honey. And it will be in that day that every place where there used to be 1,000 vines, valued at 1,000 shekels of silver, will become briars and thorns. People will come there with bows and arrows, because all the land will be briars and thorns. As for the hills which used to be cultivated with the hoe, you will not go there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place for pasturing oxen and for sheep to trample. In other words, the agriculture of Israel would be destroyed. They would have some animals, and they would have enough animals for the people who were there to have milk, not to raise for food, but to raise for dairy. And the other food that they got, they would get from hunting and from scavenging. So this idea of the Israelites living on herds and honey is a picture of the Israelites in poverty with a destroyed land. And this wasn't a case of a nation suffering solely for the failure of one man. The king's attitude toward God was generally shared by his subjects. We've already read the beginning of chapter 8. Let's go down to chapter 8, verse 5. After these things, again, Yahweh spoke to me further, saying, Inasmuch as these people have rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh, 
and rejoice in Rezin and the son of Remaliah. Now therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the mighty and abundant waters of the river, the king of Assyria and all his glory, and it will rise up over all its channels and go over all its banks. Then it will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass through. It will reach even to the neck, and the spread of its wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. There are a few different ways people understand verse 6 when it says you rejoice in Rezin and the son of Remaliah, which is Pekah, these two kings. Most likely, though, the prophecy, this prophecy right here, was given after those two kings had been defeated. And the people of Jerusalem were rejoicing in their defeat. Believing that their alliance with Assyria had paid off. Shiloh, the gently flowing waters that are mentioned, was the aqueduct that brought water into Jerusalem. By saying that the people have rejected it, God is saying that they have rejected what was theirs and gone after somebody else's. The security that he has provided for them, they did not consider enough. And so they went and sought security from the king of Assyria. They have exchanged God's peace for the turbulent violence of the Assyrians. And it is the violence of the Assyrians that they will receive as a result. We've seen the coming deliverance that God is going to work, and also the coming destruction that will occur later when Assyria invades. Now let's uh, look at the current decision, the current decision that these people face. In verse 9 of chapter 8, Be broken, O peoples, and be shattered, and give ear all remote places of the earth. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Devise counsel, but it will be thwarted. Speak a word, but it will not stand. For Emmanuel. Because Emmanuel. Because God is with us. Emmanuel is the word there. The Lord has continually preserved his people, and he always will. And the best laid plans of man cannot thwart his. Because of what Christ has done, and because of the work of the Holy Spirit, we can say God is with us in an even truer and more intimate sense than the Israelites could. And if God is for us, who can be against us? No one is greater than him. No one has any reason to fear when God is on their side. And this isn't merely a rebuke to the nations, to those who are seeking to attack Israel. It's a rebuke to Judah itself for failing to trust in the one who is all-powerful and all-good. At this point, God shifts his focus away from kings and nations and begins talking directly to Isaiah and those like him, common people who aren't in charge of these decisions being made, but who are caught up in situations beyond their control. Just as kings need to trust in God, we common people need to as well. We can still express faith in any situation. Verse 11, For thus Yahweh spoke to me with a strong hand and disciplined me not to walk in the way of this people. This is something he cares about strongly and disciplined. Isaiah, Isaiah says, 
so that I would not walk in the way of this people, saying, and this is what God said, you are not to say it is a conspiracy in regards to all this people called a conspiracy, and you are not to fear what they fear, and you shall not tremble. Conspiracy theorists are not a modern phenomenon. They have always been around. And at this time, it wasn't just outside of Judah that things were tense. There was political intrigue and suspicion. There were people in Jerusalem, of course, who wanted Ahaz to join with Israel and around. They thought that was the best decision. And people working against each other, coming up with plots, coming up with solutions. But even though a lot of that stuff was going on, and conspiracies were being made, how likely a certain theory is to be true is not the point. The point is the attitude of fear. What God is condemning is an obsession with fearful possibilities. Maybe, for us, Russia, China, Big Pharma, AI, and Hollywood are all working together. Maybe they are to destroy the world. But, did it really benefit you spiritually to stay up all night thinking about it? Right? Either God is in control or he isn't. There is no place in Christian faith for paranoia. Even if the world does fall apart, God will put it together again. Even if we die, God will bring us back to life. We have nothing to fear from men. Paranoia is not a godly <clears throat> attitude. Never trust a news reporter, a salesman, or especially anyone who calls you on the phone, however legitimate they sound, who tries to make you afraid. When people do that, they are not doing it for your benefit. They are doing it for theirs. When someone appeals to your fear, it's usually because they want you to run for security to whatever they are promoting. When we feel ourselves in danger, our natural response is to cling in desperation to the first thing that gives us a sliver of hope, even if it's the railing of a sinking ship. <coughs> the only fear we ought to have is a fear of the consequences of not trusting God. In the big picture, nothing else is scary. Verses 13 and 14. It is Yahweh of hosts whom you should regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be the cause of your trembling. Then he shall become a sanctuary. But to both the houses of Israel, a stone to strike, and a rock to stumble over, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Isn't it interesting how the way the Bible, especially the Old Testament, uses the term fearing God, it means almost exactly the same thing as trusting God. Fearing God and trusting God are two sides of the same coin. If you truly fear God, then you won't fear anything else. Jesus told his disciples not to fear those who would oppose their message. For there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in darkness, Jesus said, speak in the light, and what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul. But rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Of course, we know that if we truly trust in Christ, we don't need to be worried about going to hell. But it is sobering to realize that that is the God that we obey. That is the God that we serve. 
the God who has that power. The power of judgment. But that is something we do not need to fear because of Christ. He took our punishment when he died on the cross. And the resurrected life he lives is a life we share with him. We live because he lives. And that life will never end. Those who trust God have nothing to fear from men. The worst they can do is kill us. But those who fear men prove that they lack real confidence in God. He is a sanctuary to those who fear him. But to those who don't, he is a rock to strike and a stone to stumble over. The word sanctuary... In verse 14, he shall become a sanctuary. It refers to a holy place, like the sanctuary of the temple. God promises to be with those who fear him. Emmanuel, again. Though the word isn't used here. The problem is that King Ahaz, and uh, I believe many people today, have a view of God that is too small to allow them to trust him completely. A lot of us, even if we have a proper view of God, don't keep it in front of our minds. We forget when we are afraid and we go another way. But it's important that our view of God is accurate, that it is biblical, that he has power in any situation. Yes, we have free will. God will hold us accountable, each of us, for the decisions we make. But that fact does not diminish his power and sovereignty. And you can call that a contradiction if you like, but the Bible is abundantly clear on that. From the heart of a king to the petals of a flower, there is nothing in creation over which God cannot or over which he does not exercise control. And we need an almighty God. Only an almighty God will meet our needs if we do not see God as great enough to overcome every source of fear that we encounter, then our hearts will naturally be drawn away to other sources of power. Verse 15. Many will stumble over them. Then they will fall and be broken. They will even be snared and caught. Over this stone, he speaks of. When Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple, eight days after he was born, to have him circumcised, an old man named Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul as well, that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. The response that people had to Jesus' ministry revealed what was in their hearts. Those who loved God and desired to be near him naturally found themselves drawn to Christ. God the Son. The hypocrites, those who heart those whose hearts were far from God, resisted and worked against him. What is your response to Christ? Are you drawn ever closer and closer to Emmanuel, to the gentle waters of Shiloh, or are you trying to run into other things and resenting him for getting in your way? For always trying to bring you back to him alone. Our greatest danger does not come from the things we fear, but from the things we are tempted to trust instead of trusting God. What would make you feel unsafe if you lost it? Your job? Your savings? The American government? 
the danger is not necessarily that those things will betray us in the way that the Assyrians betrayed Ahaz. The real danger is that we will never realize how empty they are and that we will continue to trust them and that that trust, which rightly belongs to God alone, will prevent us from being effective for him. Where is our faith? Let's find it. Sweep it up, every scrap, and put it where it belongs. Let's all stand. Come, thou long expected Jesus. chapter 2, 11 through 13, it says, For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. Christ is the one who makes us holy, sanctifies us. We are the ones who are sanctified. We are both, him and us, of one. We are both of the Father. And for this reason, he is not ashamed to call them, to call us brothers, saying, I will recount your name to my brothers. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children whom God has given me. Remember, that's from Isaiah. Isaiah and the children God had given him were foreshadowings of Christ and us. We are part of his family. He is born into our family. You are physically related to Jesus Christ. Just as you are physically related to every other human being on this earth. The incarnation, the word becoming flesh, is what we celebrate at Christmas. 
but the reason for the incarnation, as we were reminded this morning, is the cross. Verses 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same. He took flesh and blood like us. So that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. So much of the power Satan holds over people comes from his fear, from the, our fear of death. Like many tyrants, he uses that fear to keep us in line. As Christians, that fear is gone for us. Fear hold, death holds no sting for the Christian because Jesus died and because he came back to life, because we live with him through faith. Because Jesus was truly one of us, he was able to pay the penalty that the human race deserved to pay, that a member of the human race had to pay. And because he truly is one of us, because he became part of our family, we can become part of his family. When we trust in him and in him alone for our salvation, we become part of the family of God. We become God's own adopted children. If you've never done that, if you've never trusted in Christ, and in only Christ, I would encourage you to do that this morning. The time is running out on the world, as it has been for many hundreds of years now. The time is running out even more quickly, most likely, for us as individuals. None of us are guaranteed another opportunity to accept him. And it's something that we do in our own hearts, something that only we know for sure is genuine. We come to him and we accept the gift he offers. And we receive that new life. As I've already said, not a life that begins in heaven, but a life that begins right now. A transforming, miraculous experience with him that we have every day. God with us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your promises, the ones that you fulfilled the ones that you're fulfilling right now and the ones that are still future. Help us to remember all the times that you've been faithful to us in the past and give us confidence as we go forward that you will always be faithful, that we don't need to be afraid, that we don't need to trust anything for what you have promised us, that you are enough to make us secure. And... Thank you so much for sending Christ to make all of this possible, everything that we have. Our whole relationship with you is built on him. Without him, there's no way we could come anywhere close to your glory. But through him, we can come into your very presence. And through your Holy Spirit, you come into us and give us the strength to live for you. Use us, we pray in this world. Let us be lights. Let people see your glory from looking at us, at the change that you've made. And receive all of the glory from what we do today, this week, 
and for the rest of our earthly lives. Let us live for you and for you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.